Hello, everybody. I welcome you all to the panel Cyber War versus Net Peace. I think it's a very interesting topic. And um, first of all, um, the speakers that we have invited will introduce themselves, will give, give a short introduction of themselves, and also um, give us a definition uh, of the term cyber war or net peace from their perspective, and tell us a little bit um, what's their relationship uh, to cyber war or net peace. So we start with Fukami. Hello, um, I'm Fokami. Um, I come from Germany, uh, from the Chaos Computer Club, which is uh, a very old NGO from, from Germany. Um, especially, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a group that's especially focused on um, civil liberties uh, in the digital age. <clears throat> um, what I do uh, for, uh, for a living is IT security in a small company doing offensive security, which means um, attacking to protect. Um, and uh, in the EU institutions, I do you know, like lobbying for digital rights, especially for um, um, a group called EDRI. Uh, yeah, and um, first of all, I want to thank for the invitation, but I want to uh, also thank for the, for the phrase cyber peace um, versus, ne uh, um, cyber uh, war versus net uh, peace, because um, cyber, <coughs> for people like me who, who read um, lots and lots of paper over the like, 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 uh, last 20 years or so, um, whenever we had the phrase cyber, with something, um, it is in fact really, really bad and stupid. Um, and actually, the, the term cyber peace, as you have on your on your um, shirt, for example, is an oxymoron in my point of view because um, uh, it, it became a very, very bad connotation. Um, so that you don't even need the words war and peace after. Uh, this one, cyber versus net, um, is, <laughs> is enough to, to, to phrase what it is all about. So for me, it's um, strictly about um, splitting um, the idea of uh, a military way of uh, looking through infrastructure versus um, the civil way of um, thinking about it. So um, the main difference uh, is the outcome in terms of how you think about policies for protecting civil infrastructure um, and uh, what you mean with defense, in fact, because if you look um, to it from a military way uh, or from the military perspective, you have a completely different um, way you, you um, want to solve problems or you even see problems. So in my, in my point of view, it's uh, a strictly um, separation between those two ways of um, watching to infrastructure. I'm Elnar Seta. Um, I've got about a decade or so of a background as a security consultant, and these days I mostly work on defense and protection for high-risk users um, and a certain amount of policy work on the side as well. So. If you actually look at what, what people are talking about inside DOD or whoever when they're talking about cyber war, they end up talking about a few different things. One big chunk of it is surveillance. Another big chunk of it is attacking domestic infrastructure in, in um, whatever country they don't like this week, which as far as I can tell is all of them. Um, and this, that combination, you know, and then there's a, then there's a small amount of stuff which is you know, military actions against, you know, what we might call in another context legitimate targets, um, which would be the military infrastructure of other nations, those things that, you know, were they doing them on, in a, you know, a battlefield under rule of law and the laws of war would actually be considered legitimate targets, um, you know, which is a, a minuscule component of what they actually do. Um, that perspective leads us in a couple of different directions. One is that they should start divesting um, military and civilian infrastructure. One is that they should start, um, well, I guess we'll get into some of this later, but um, 
that, that as long as you're allowing that military mindset to shape the, the structure of infrastructure, you're going to end up with a very different um, a very different view of how infrastructure should be built. DOD has this understanding that, of course, all communications infrastructure should be under their purview because it's all a military target because that's how they see the world. Um, whereas a less militarized society might want to say to DOD, well, you guys need to go build your own infrastructure because otherwise you're going to be effectively militarizing our internets. Um, so that's sort of where I start start thinking about this is looking how it impacts things at the infrastructural level. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi to everybody. Um, I'm Francesca Bosco and I'm working for UNICRI, which is a United Nations Institute dealing with uh, crime and justice and I'm uh, specifically responsible for cybercrime and uh, cybersecurity projects. Um, uh, well, thanks a lot for, for the invitation, and I'm very happy of being here and especially sharing uh, uh, the stage with uh, those estimates colleagues. Um, um, actually, I think that the, the state of uh, conflict online is in flux, so I wouldn't uh, um, call it necessary uh, cyber war or war, but uh, definitely there is, um, uh, on the overall, there is a, a general um, perception of absence of physical arm as a result of cyber attacks, but uh, in reality, uh, we have uh, massive violations of, privacy, of privacy, human and other fundamental rights, um, along with uh, uh, severe economic damages that have occurred within today's conflict with an online environment, and uh, uh, they might, let's say, amount to warlike acts in some respects. Um, uh, I would uh, suggest to next time to start with the net peace versus cyber war, because I think that unfortunately nowadays we perceive cyber peace as a negative compared to cyber war was we should start from the other way around actually. We should start discussing about cyber peace and making uh, uh, let's say the internet a peaceful environment and then we should also think about how to protect it clearly and uh, how to possibly defend it from uh, the uh, rising conflict. Jacob. Hi, um, <clears throat> thanks for having me again. I guess I represent the uh, immigrant vote in Europe as I'm an American washed up on the shores of Europe living in Germany as a resident. Um, I, I work as a journalist with Der Spiegel and other publications because in the country in which I live I cannot work anymore doing these things because I work on things like the Merkel phone that was one of my stories in Der Spiegel uh, and as a result of that I live in political exile which is a kind of harsh reality and maybe it'll change. Um, I'm not really hopeful for the U.S. changing. The last panel we had a discussion about this um, and uh, the, the nice Italian man said that the U.S. wasn't a democracy and I thought that was quite a funny thing um, to say because it implied that it was to begin with um, before Edward Snowden. <clears throat> um, but it uh, depends on when in history if you count women and people of color, for example. Anyway. Um, as a free software developer, I work on the Tor project and I work on anonymity systems, privacy by design. Um, Basically, when I think about the idea of cyber war or cyber peace, I mean, I have a hard time hearing those terms. I'm a little bit like Fukami, I'm also part of the Chaos Computer Club, and when I hear the word cyber, I think of probably what half of the people in this room think of if you're over 25, and you don't talk about that with other people openly, you use OTR when you, when you do those kinds of things, you know. Uh, and for the rest of you that don't understand that, that's okay. Um, but I think what we should talk about is not internet freedom or internet censorship or cyber war or cyber peace, but we should talk about it just in terms of liberty and freedom, peace and censorship. The fact that there is technology involved does not mean that we should sabotage and change things about liberal democracy that we, in a, in a sense, have begun to take for granted. And I think that's a really serious thing. So um, to me, cyber war is an attempt at a power dynamic shift wherein we militarize our societies, our communication networks, the very roads we walk down. Um, and so when you hear people talking about cyber war, I feel like what you're hearing is you're hearing an attempt to shift power, an attempt to gain power, um, usually in a way where there's no democracy, no transparency, no accountability, no oversight at all. And um, fundamentally, where I fit in this is that I think that we should pretty much fundamentally stop tilting the balance towards a positive signals intelligence world and towards a communication security world where each person has the ability to freely communicate without fear of being monitored or if there is monitoring without concern that the encryption that they're using is fundamentally weakened 
say by standardized uh, standardized uh, crypto algorithms being backdoored or things like that. Um, and yeah, so I guess that puts me firmly in the hippie peace camp, and that should be quite obvious because I would like to improve people's civil liberties. I'd like to improve the ability for people to not only to speak freely, but to read, to be able to publish the things that they'd like to publish, and to be able to write free software to understand how the machines that we use are actually um, ours and how they function, to be able to study them, to change them, to share those changes with our neighbors, and so on. So um, yeah, I, I really wish there was someone here that was pro-cyber war so that we could demolish them. <laughs> but I suspect that that will not happen on this panel. So maybe I'm wrong and someone here, like Fukami, will take up the position of uh, being in favor of weapons or something, but... Okay, so um, the Canadian philosopher um, Marshall McLuhan, uh, he has a famous quotation from 1969, which says, World War III is a guerrilla information war with no division between military and civilian participation. So what we've heard now from, 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 from you uh, a little bit was about uh, attacking, le le uh, attacking uh, military um, targets by uh, hacking attempts or stuff like that. And uh, uh, Jake spoke about um, privacy and anonymity. So um, how are the, is, is the ordinary citizen today um, um, being drawn into the cyber war? So is it only something which is in a military domain or is it also coming to the civil domain? So the ordinary internet user, is they, are they also affected or part of cyber war today? Yeah. I mean, there's only one internet, right? So if you want to fight a war on the internet, you're fighting a war mm -hmm. in everybody's lives. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is, I think that if, to the extent that the, that the militaries want to play these games, they need to go build their own networks to do them on. You know, it's not acceptable in the same way that it's not acceptable for you to have a gunfight in the middle of a hospital as an army. We, you know, we have laws against that kind of thing. You can't have a gunfight in the middle of a civilian network. You need to stop, you know, they need to stop doing that. Um, you know, and this gets into a lot of, you know, even, even to the extent that you're looking in their way of thinking about the world, so, you know, one of the things in, in the law of war is that you're required to prepare the terrain via surveillance before you attack. Um, you know, this is, you know, so that you don't accidentally end up bombing a hospital. The problem is that when you prepare the terrain in cyber war, well, you go own a bunch of networks to figure out what they are, and you've now just bombed the hospital. You know, you've already done the thing, that there's no difference between surveillance and attack. Um, so I think that... that to the extent that we want to have, the, that the militaries want to have a system where they can um, fight in this domain in their world, then they need to go separate, you know, they, they've taken that onus on them to go separate that out. Um, you know, and unless, unless they do, they're, they're committing war crimes. You know, that the existence of U.S. Cyber Command implies a war crime because it is attacking civilian infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> there's one um, example where you um, already see where it hits. Um, when you come from an IT security perspective, there's something very scary called the Tallinn Manual. Um, is someone not knowing what it is all about? Have you all heard of it? So th that's like uh, the cyber war doctrine of the um, US they proposed at the NATO gathering in Tallinn last year, which was basically about uh, if someone discloses vulnerabilities in um, an infrastructure uh, of the USA, um, um, the US can declare the person or the group a war target. So it means something which is com perfectly normal in a civil society to talk about insecurities, to, um, to, uh, to discuss vulnerabilities, um, is committed or like is viewed uh, in a way that, that uh, one state thinks about in, in aggression and answers with like a military strike. And that's like unacceptable. Um, but this is actually one thing which um, has real effects. One effect is like having a, a chilling effect that people don't um, talk about vulnerabilities, but we have to talk about that. 
And the other thing is that you um, are really threatened because um, it is quite easy to, to, uh, for the military or for the intelligence agencies to, to, to go to people who are threatened by, you know, like, you do bad things, so come to us uh, and uh, you won't uh, be threatened by the others. So for us, it's very important to, um, to not draw the distinction between, for example, um, intelligence communities and criminals, because from the, from the, the, um, the, the civil perspective, it is exactly no difference if you get attacked by the Chinese, by the NSA, or by, by, by criminals. Um, and the protection means are exactly the same thing. So for us, it's all about getting the right, uh, or the, 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 yeah, the, the um, how to say, uh, what's the right phrase for it? It's not getting the right. Anyways, um, just um, uh, being able to talk about insecurities without any um, way of getting yeah, punished for it or, 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 or uh, get threatened, that is really, really important. And in my point of view, one of the most important things when it comes to the main discussion we have around um, IT security and uh, securing civil society. Yeah, I, I think that surveillance itself is an act of aggression. And I think when we talk about this notion of cyber war, if we are going to dignify the word cyber war, which I suppose we are, unfortunately, um, I think that it should be clear that when this institution that we're sitting in is one of the legitimate targets, we should question the notion of legitimate target. And I mean, when people talk about targeted surveillance, for example, what they mean is a, a selector. And what does that mean? A selector is any unique string or identifier that someone can use to look through a network flow to be able to correlate traffic on the internet to be able to target you for electronic or other so-called kinetic attacks. And I think that if we understand that, it becomes really scary, what this notion of the legitimate target is. And especially when we're talking about people that believe in assassination politics, quite literally, where we know that they use drones to kill people with that metadata. Um, when we're talking about cyber war, it should be clear that we're not really talking about cyber anything. We're talking about just straight up fucking murder and war. That's what we're talking about. And so when people talk about the so-called legitimacy of that, I think it should be clear that assassinations, for example, are not legitimate in democratic societies. And it should also be clear that the surveillance that supports them is an act of aggression and a crime, and it should be treated as such. So, for example, arresting NSA and CAA people in Europe would be a good start. What are they doing operating here, right? They're helping to facilitate murder with their surveillance. That's, that's a reality. In Germany, for example, that is happening with the drone bases that are based in Germany and with the feeds that they take. Why is that tolerated? That's crazy to me. Um, and that's just one small part of a much bigger picture. And so I think we shouldn't separate this from the notion of just war in general. So call it cyber war is, I think, to do a disservice of that. And I think, but maybe, maybe I'm you know, stepping a little too far out, it's, it's important to not really divide the electronic internet from the real world because it allows people to gain ground, again, in topics where we have already seen the horrors of what we're talking about take place. I mean, I'm reading a book right now, which is a great book so far. Let me just pull it out. It's by one of my favorite authors. Uh, allow me to, is it Jan Valtan, uh, Jan Valtin, uh, Wintertime. He wrote another book called Out of the Night. And I feel like if you want to connect with uh, the horrors of the 20th century, and the horrors of politics, this guy has done a really great job of showing you why you should never be working towards issues of war. And we should be working to try to secure peace and to secure the communication networks that facilitate more war. I mean, really, really bad stuff if you read about this. I mean, most of you actually had a European history lesson that was worth more than this book, I'm sure. But if you just read one thing, reading about the horrors there, when people are talking about hoarding exploits and then using them against people and about legitimate targets, they're really talking about ruining people's lives, murdering them, spying on them, terrorizing them. And that's, uh, to me, I, I think we should build an alternative to that. And I think it's really easy. Every time they say, let's spy on people, you say no. Every time they say, let's hoard vulnerabilities, you say, no, let's fix them. It's really easy to be a positivist in this regard, and I think that that's what we should be working to do, is to actually be working to create peace in a world where it's very easy to wage war. Uh, 
starting from what Jake was saying, um, uh, two points. One, uh, I totally disagree with the word cyber war, and we can use warfare, we can use conflict, but again, uh, it's definitely misleading. It's a very sexy world. It is uh, in nowadays uh, um, uh, magazines and, and media, uh, but we should also fight the, I think, the misuse of words, because words have meaning and consequences, and especially war has consequences uh, at the legal and international relations level. Um, uh, uh, I take the point of oversight, accountability and transparency because uh, if we are really talking about the involvement of, let's say, the, the user as the citizens, uh, it means that uh, not only the United States but also many other states, um, I'm talking for the UN, so many member states are uh, building uh, cyber armies uh, similar to the American Cyber Command, uh, or they are developing uh, cyber security policies where uh, it's integrated, uh, where elements of uh, cyber war and cyber defense are integrated. So um, as a citizen, uh, I would ask for transparency in these policies uh, and especially in their process in the budget which is allocated uh, for these operations uh, and uh, uh, for building, for example, cyber army. And uh, uh, definitely, uh, I, I would like to know how the investigations and uh, the surveillance is made, for which reason, and uh, uh, which is the role uh, of the citizens uh, in securing the space that we're work living in. So, I guess the unfortunate thing about the history, if you look at um, if you look at the history of international surveillance and international intelligence surveillance and the rule of law, um, there's basically no interaction between the two. Um, rule of law has proven to be completely ineffective at stopping international surveillance historically. Um, and there's no reason to believe that that will change. There are a lot of things that can happen around uh, using rule of law to restrict policing and police surveillance. Um, if nothing else, because in the end of the day, um, this stuff has to show up in court, you know, assuming that you still have a court. Um, but if you look at the history in the intelligence world, it's not as good. Um, what does work is economics. And I don't think that, I don't see, you know, it's, it's, it's good if we, if we can use legal tools, you know, we should definitely use those tools to the extent that, to the extent that they're available, to the extent that they can make a difference. Great. But, um, you know, when we built the internet, it made, it took communications from a thing that was notably expensive to being basically free, you know. Measuring the cost of communications between people, you know, when you're talking about less than a, a million people, it's noise. It's, it's you know, it's, it's barely even worth measuring these costs. Um, and unfortunately, this is true of surveillance now as well, that unless you're surveilling millions of people, you're not even really spending money. Um, unless that economics changes, intelligence surveillance isn't going to change. You know, and we can, we can talk about transparency around budgets and, and around what exploits get, get pulled up all we want, but it doesn't work in the end. Yeah, picking up at that uh, um, idea, um, in my point of view, um, what the, the relations uh, showed was not only like the surveillance part, what was much more shocking in my point of view was um, it clearly showed how uh, incredible insecure our technical world is. Um, so it's so easy f uh, just to, to, to tap, to infiltrate and stuff like that. So um, one possibility we have in fact is making it more expensive and I completely agree with uh, the economic aspect of uh, surveillance. Um, but it's also about uh, getting a better um, way of, you know, like how our technology works. And um, a couple of ways we, can, we could do from policy side is, for example, to have liabilities and even warranties on, on, on software because in the moment it's really like, um, in the physical world we have like liabilities for everything, yeah? but it, it's not for software. So, and we really have to think about um, if it's okay that way. Yeah? And we have to have a way that um, insecurity has to be much more expensive than security. In the moment, it's completely the opposite. Um, so we have to, to have a, a fundamental change of how we, we implement technical solutions or, or standards and stuff like that. I mean, like, um, I thought the other panel, there was already um, uh, a discussion about 
um, stuff like Etsy, so our telecommunication standards, they, are, uh, um, they include backdoors, uh, um, surveillance is like mandatory for stuff like, uh, for, for yeah, another building net for networks and stuff, um, and we, we have the possibility to change this um, in a much easier way than um, having something like uh, uh, forbid the, the intelligence community to, to spy because they will do that anyway. So we have the chance to secure our society, uh, or one part of it um, is to, to um, look at the, the economic um, possibilities we have. Um, I, I just wanted to add one thing uh, to what uh, Fukami was saying. Um, I, I totally like the idea of uh, making the uh, let's say, the surveillance more expensive, let's say, compared to, uh, to our um, um, everyday, uh, um, let's say, use of the internet. My, my point is also that uh, uh, there's also, a, um, unfortunately, a contrast between uh, security and usability, uh, still. And so I think this is the, the perfect venue for discussing also the need, uh, not only for, um, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, enhancing uh, security measures, but also uh, regarding, I totally agree with you on the liability of software, I would put, say, also hardware productors, oh, yeah. definitely. Uh, and apart from that, um, I would also call for um, uh, more research and uh, hopefully more funding also from DC for uh, uh, better security measures and uh, better instruments that can be used by everybody. And uh, um, I would also say that um, it's, um, uh, I, I totally agree, it's a matter of uh, economics, uh, but if we still believe <laughs> that we will live in a democratic society, it's also a matter of shared responsibility. And I, I do believe in that. Uh, we need to enhance uh, a culture of security, so it's not just about security measures or security softwares, but uh, uh, we need to understand that we need to secure let's say, our, um, um, our everyday life in a different way. And this can also, um, regarding cost, can also the lower the cost, because if we all uh, are behaving in a better way, let's say, uh, definitely the cost and also the possible damages are lowering down. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Um, now I, I'd like to encourage you all um, to ask questions, if you have some. Here's one question from uh, the first row. So you can press the button and then please uh, give us your question. Uh, thank you, I'm Mikael Berg from the Pirate Party of Finland. I think my comment comes in well after Francesco Bosco. Um, um, do you remember, or at least uh, most, many of you will remember that in the months preceding the the war in Iraq, 2003, the New York Times had an ed editorial uh, speaking about the second superpower. And that second superpower was the world opinion, millions, millions of people, the peace movement in the streets um, against starting the war in Iraq. Um, we should also think about the relation of this uh, second superpower, which is uh, more like a hope. Um, we should think about its relation to the growth of the internet, the birth of the internet and the growth of the internet. And we will then see that there is really a problematic about the internet and the peace. Uh, we must not for, uh, drop the, the concept of peace. Uh, I think I agree with everything you have said, and it has been very informative, uh, but this dimension was lacking. Um, I don't doubt that we are a part of the peace movement, but it, we should made it, make it more clear. And uh, to make it more clear, I want to invite you to the Peace Event Sarajevo 2014, uh, 6th to 9th June, which is a um, common event of the peace movements in Europe, especially to commemorate the 100 years since the First World War broke out, but also to precisely develop 
for instance, uh, the idea of how the internet could bring about a situation where people are more secure, where human security is uh, stressed. And I tried to uh, arrange a workshop about this theme there. I have registered it and I invite you all there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think it was uh, uh, not, not, not a question, but more, um, uh, yeah. Um, now we have someone from, from behind who also had a question and then... Do yes, okay, uh, thank you. Bjorn Flintberg, Swedish Pirate Party. Um, I have one question and just first a reflection. Um, I mean, I think most of us agree that, that, uh, uh, that it is indeed warfare, no matter how you clad it in words. Um, one challenge I see since, since I studied in the U.S. and studied national security policy in the U.S., which is quite interesting for European, um, was that you can see quite clearly from the doctrine used there that the borders that we have in Europe due to our unique history between the industrial, the military, and the political complex simply do not exist in the same way in the U.S. So, so Wherever the, corporate, the largest corporations go, there's also a, um, a seeping over of information and data into the military complex and vice versa with the, with the political entity. So the sharing, sharing of information makes it very hard for us to make legislation here because it, as soon as you invite corporations over for free trade, there's a risk that this data is being used for various purposes. Um, and there were reports... Uh, a couple of, of years ago uh, of um, surveillance equipment in the embassies and so on and more recently we've had e other examples. One, one thing I wanted to ask the, the panel about is, is that we talked a bit about the, the actual attacks, the drone attacks, the subversive attacks with data mining, but I think perhaps one of the most dangerous efforts at this moment is the what, what would you could call the psychological warfare, the strategic warfare being conducted by policy influencing, uh, actively being conducted by foreign, foreign military intelligence and lobbyists and representatives that actually try to target our legislative process and influencing it for weaker data protection and so on. How do we combat that type of, of influence, which is of course more subtle than a direct attack, but I think it's at least as dangerous because of the way the parliament works here that we are a slow moving process which means that once the legislation has been set it doesn't change very quickly so how do we counter threats of that nature that are more subtle and, and attack our own policy making um, um. First of all, uh, one of the main problems we have is that surveillance and like the, the, um, the, the cyber warfare meme is something uh, which is uh, simply big business. Um, if you watch what um, all those intelligence agencies and, and a military, uh, the military complex get, um, gets from like uh, uh, either like, like a research projects or like from, from the government to, to uh, conduct surveillance and stuff like that. It's like really, really uh, not about money. Um, and it's very hard to change that. Um, even if we start to, to, to have better policies for protecting society, um, it just raises the bar and it means uh, more money for them as well in the long run. Um, I have no idea how to, how to, to, to counter that actually. Um, because uh, my main focus is really about um, having meaningful um, protection mechanisms um, inside laws uh, uh, or, or like legislation in, 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 uh, in any way, but um, it's not about fighting um, capitalism or, or fighting uh, like this, this uh, um, complex at the core. Yeah, it's really basically about, you know, like stuff we can do and which we can really influence. Uh, you cannot, you know, <laughs> why do you laugh? <laughs> well, when you say it's not about fighting capitalism, um, isn't that exactly part of the problem? I mean, for example, Europe has socially constrained capitalism, which is the notion that society and democracy should have some control over 
um, a capitalist world. I mean, it, I, I, I feel like you actually can do that, and successfully in Europe you have done that. I mean, not so much with Facebook and data protection, for example, but with lots of other things, that is true. Regulation of GMO foods and stuff. I mean, it seems like an impossible task in America, but here you've, in some cases, dealt with that. So, I, I mean, that's why I was laughing, is that yeah, from my perspective, you have a democracy, whereas I basically don't. Yeah. So, you know, maintain some perspective. That's why I'm, I'm laughing, so... Yeah, but still, um, even um, I think the discussions we we have now and for the next two three years uh, um, are necessary. But uh, we need to 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 keep in mind that uh, real policy changes we are talking about like decades uh, and not like years or months or whatever. So um, in the moment, it's all about um, looking um, at those places where we could start to. To, to, to have some changes, to have meaningful changes of security policies in terms of, you know, like, uh, real technical means and real technical uh, uh, outcomes. I, I just want to say four, four things to Fukami and then I'll cede. But <laughs> basically, I don't think that we're talking about decades of work if you think about it in this way. Notification about surveillance events, both before, during, and after, so that there can be due process is a very straightforward thing, but it's very controversial because there's the notion that for surveillance to be successful in the legal regime, you have to make sure that someone doesn't know they're being surveilled so that you can catch them. Um, but actually, people who are really hardened to surveillance, like myself, maybe you'll catch me, probably not, right? So what about other people who are terrorized by the fact that they could be spied on and they have no recourse and they can never know and they're never notified and so on? Um, another point is that we should, in fact, not have back doors in our systems by design. These are really simple things. In fact, it's a policy change of one line that yeah, says that we don't cripple that. Yeah, but, but uh, not, it, uh, it doesn't work in the, in the real short run. Uh, sure, even, does red even, phone right even now. Even if you say, okay, uh, no back doors anymore, everything which is back doors is still in the field. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah. Course, of course. But what I mean is that right now there's almost no alternatives. And part of the reason is because the tech and the law don't match up in a way that reflects the civil society values and the civil liberties we'd like. So, for example, we want to make it so that tech and law actually mesh in this way. So red phone and tech secure and off the record messaging, I don't believe that the NSA can break those. So, and the NSA, for example, has said that tails makes their life hell, makes it difficult for them. So that says to me that there are things that we can do right now. That doesn't mean everyone gets that protection right away. Maybe that takes decades. But it really is a couple of policy changes right off the bat that would make a world of difference that would allow us to create that, that ground for the next several decades of work to take place. But that, that first step is something we have not yet seen. No European politician or American politician has said, that they want to see all phone calls encrypted in a forward secret manner where the keys are only in the hands of the users. That should happen. Some European politicians should make those statements and we should end so-called lawful interception, for example. That's totally doable if someone is willing to stick their neck out and do it. Uh, yeah, sure. So I guess I wanted to um, first pick up something else that you said briefly about um, uh, the interaction with corporations and uh, the relationship between uh, corporations and surveillance in, in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, corporations in the, in the EU actually do a lot of surveillance, um, just as much as corporations do in the U.S. Um, and this is one of the things which isn't getting talked about as much right now. If you look at um, firms like Heilerkut um, or a lot of the, the private intelligence firms that work with people like Shell and Coca-Cola and these kinds of things, you know, a lot of the cases these are these are run. Uh, Helicut was started by a tranche of MI6 officers who left, who kept their clearances and kept working and, and sharing intelligence. So, you know, there are there are a lot of ties, and it and it goes a lot deeper into a lot of other places that we haven't heard about. Um, I think that one of the things which will make a big difference as far as the independence of media processes in. Um, the independence of, or the independence of political processes in Europe is, you know, a continuing stream of news, of leaks, of this kind of information coming out because that keeps the focus and it keeps a certain awareness of where the manipulation is happening. If you, you know, if, if all of this goes away and we stop talking about this, then yes, of course it's going to be easy to get, um, you know, specific legal changes through, but there's, you know, continual pressure will make a big difference here. Um, Unlike Jake, I'm not very hopeful about notification. Um, you know, there, 
there's no democracy in intelligence. Democracy doesn't touch the intelligence world. And it never has. So maybe, this, maybe, we can, maybe we can break ground in a way that is completely historically unprecedented, but it will be historically unprecedented. I have a question for you, Eleanor. Would you say that you believe that technology may make it possible that you can detect that someone has tampered, even if you don't know who has done the tampering? If we can, make, if we can create technical solutions which make it impossible to do it without notice, then we have room. But that's a technical solution, not a policy solution. And those are, those are completely different things. Saying that we want notification before surveillance purely as an administrative matter that you will receive a little note in the mail from NSA saying, hey, by the way, we're going to start tapping your phone next week? No. To, I just wanted What's to briefly question? comment on, on the question and try to answer. Uh, first of all, what you, the, the question was what we can do. Um, uh, first of all, for example, at the European level, there was a big discussion um, when uh, all the issue of Finn Fisher and surveillance technologies came out, and basically there was the, uh, uh, the discussion on, um, uh, uh, let's say, banning the export of surveillance technologies to regime. What I would like to see is an oversight of surveillance technology, not only on, in regimes, but also in European countries, first of all. Secondly, um, uh, I do believe in a European institution. I also think that what the NSA and the data gate uh, showed was the fact that the, at the national level uh, there's not a deep debate and an informed debate about it and I think that as citizens we should ask let's say our government uh, what they are I mean which is their position on this issue and again um, how basically they're using our money the um, uh, last two things, one, uh, I came back to what I said before, so creating a culture of security, which means encryption, as uh, Jacob mentioned, anonymity, definitely. And uh, as a last thing, uh, um, um, coming back to what Eleanor said about the fact that it's a technical solution, um, yeah, we need to integrate uh, techies, let's say, and policymakers uh, definitely much more. I think that uh, there were some improvements uh, in a try to connect uh, laws and technologies, uh, but they think that definitely there uh, should be much more involvement of the technological side uh, into the policymaker side. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, now around uh, 30 minutes left, and we have a few questions. The first was uh, uh, you over there. Please press the button and then give us your question. I'll try to keep it uh, short. Um, my name is Dirk Poot of the Dutch Pirate Party, and uh, most of the members of the panel spoke about uh, changing the economics of wiretapping. And to me, the most obvious one would be to, to change the, the degree of, uh, of, of encryption in our society from the, the 1% we have now to uh, 200%. That would be the, the best option, I think. Uh, and moving away from the centralized services that we use now to you know, everybody have their own email server, so it's uh, less difficult to, to hack a whole bunch of people. But apart from those, what other methods do you see to change the economics of wiretapping? And um, do you see a, a risk of the, the, the wiretapping moving up the metal towards the computer's user uh, once we reach a threshold of 50% using encryption? The interesting thing is, or, or the scary thing, or however, um, if you talk to, to um, uh, the ministries of internal affairs uh, or people who deal with national security, and it, one thing is like, um, on the EU level, we don't have any concept of national security because it's uh, clearly part uh, for, uh, for the member states. So um, uh, there is no no no... Um, uh, real influence uh, not from that side, but from the from the from the um, uh, part where we could um, make it more 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 expensive, um, and having encryption means that uh, law enforcement will start to demand uh, stuff like online search and um, offensive capabilities, and that's what uh, I already recognized in some of the discussions. They simply say, if you want to encrypt everything, uh, you have to accept the fact that we are starting to infiltrate uh, uh, the computer of suspects. And that's from, from, from law enforcement agencies, not from, uh, from intelligence community. Um, this will be a very hard discussion because um, 
if you take this whole discussion serious, you have something like um, yeah, both ends. One is like mass surveillance and the other one is like targeted attacks. In the moment we have both. Um, but uh, you clearly have um, uh, a discussion along that line. You know, what, what are you accepting and where, uh, what you are giving those like um, law enforcement agencies uh, for their capabilities to, to, um, to do what they're supposed to do. And this really means that we have a long discussion um, about how we organize it or where we make, uh, um, where we build systems um, where it simply doesn't work, that you can um, um, tap or infiltrate. And uh, this will take like, yeah, ages. Since our protocols we have right now, they are, uh, they are broken and they are, in my point of view, they are, they are, they are unfixable. Um, so I think two things which are interesting around decentralization, one of the things that we can do which will make a real difference is um, market forces and market policy to encourage decentralization. This gets into telco regulation, this gets into network neutrality laws, this gets into um, you know, innovation funding. There's a lot of different levers that we have for um, this gets into data privacy. If you suddenly start taking mass liability for any data that you collect, all of a sudden being a marketer who collects data profiles looks a lot less interesting. So other uh, business models become more, more interesting. So I think that, that a lot of different kind of n related um, areas of policy have a, have a massive, massive impact on the possibility of decentralization. One of the other places, and this is an area where we need a lot of research, is around verifiability. Um, you know, yes, open source software is great. It gives us software verifiability, assuming that stuff is actually audited. Um, we need funding for hardware ver verifiability research. Um, this is expensive, like catastrophically expensive work, which just isn't happening right now outside of a few very small, almost entirely defense structured areas. And we need hardware that we can trust. Um, so this is something that we really need to see happen. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, I would say that it is a pretty serious problem and I, I wrote down some points here. Um, like if we want to change the economics, I think that that's obviously an important thing. But I think we can start, for example, by refusing sabotage. Right now we have accepted sabotaged networks as the norm and I think that's dangerous and we don't really talk about the transitive risks. So for the Dutch government to be able to wiretap somebody in this room, um, every time a Dutch person travels abroad, they're vulnerable. It might be in Europe, but it might be traveling somewhere else. It's more serious, a place without the rule of law like the United States. That could be a really serious problem. We should not accept that sabotage as a normal thing. And in generally the way that this is foisted on us is they say, well, what about criminals? And I feel like the correct answer to that is, yes, what are you doing about the rights of your citizens who are being spied upon by the NSA and the GCHQ? What about those criminals? And that's a serious problem. So clearly we should use encryption. Forward secret crypto is really important. I don't think it's that difficult. Obviously decentralization is right. Anonymity is important for a reason which is not always obvious, but one of them is that it makes it significantly harder to target people. So I want to make targeting someone as difficult as is possible. It should be possible to buy things without having to leave paper trails behind. We can solve some of the big data surveillance problems by actually having the anonymity that we already had with cash in some cases, but in online transactions. And free software and free hardware is really important as well. And I think what Ella is saying is really critical. We really don't have uh, a lot that we can do in that area. I have a laptop here in front of me that runs Core Boot. It runs a free software operating system. It has no proprietary software on it at all. It's also a, what, an eight-year-old laptop. It barely works and it's falling apart. That's not really a great option. But if we want to talk about a concrete proposal, um, Carlo uh, in, the, in the audience here has written this and um, I think it's good. It's basically his You Broke the Internet uh, legislation and it's a proposal for legislation anyway, which talks about mandatory encryption, talks about making sure that when you have devices that when someone has the notion of security that it actually means something, the same would be true for 
uh, video or instant messaging or, or whatever communication that you're doing. And I think that this is a, this is a really good sort of a brainstorming plan which begins to address this question in a more formal way where things are written down. I think it's actually in a Git, Git repository as well, so you can just uh, send him patches to his legislation, which I think is a very uh, party-oriented way of solving this problem. <laughs> um, and I think that those will start to change the dynamics, but we shouldn't be held hostage by police officers that say, well, if you don't give us mass surveillance, then we're going to start breaking into your computers. I mean, what the fuck is that? That's crazy. That's like, if you don't do what we say, we're going to break your legs. Be a shame about your democracy there. That just seems, that seems like the wrong way to approach talking about this in a free society. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we've got around 25 minutes to go, and there are a few questions. Uh, next question is from Markus Barnhoff from uh, Pirate Party Germany. Yeah, hello. Um, I want to come back to the um, yeah, classic uh, of things like international law. And from my point of view, the most complicated thing with all those cyber war, I use the word again, uh, thing is this attribution problem that you um, cannot, so all the things in the international law depend on that you know there are those combatants, they have their patches on their uniforms and on their, on their tanks and then they drive around and you can say, okay, this is uh, the aggressor, the other one has been attacked and things like that. So you need to attribute all the actions that might happen uh, um, to someone and I think this is, as well as on the technical side, uh, it's uh, in most things nearly impossible. Maybe you find out that there is some kind of server which triggered something which can be taken as an attack, but you then don't know who's behind that, or it's very, very, very difficult to find that out in this non-physical world. So the question there um, is, the international law, when we take all these things in, uh, any use? Uh, still, or can we adapt it to, to, to make it useful again? And this in a situation where we might expect and now also know that there is malware installed everywhere. And they, we have seen it with Stuxnet that there are really things out there which can be started. And um, on the other side, we have some politics uh, who go in front of the press and say, hey, the Chinese attacked us two days ago. Everyone who has a little bit knowledge of the technology knows that this guy that cannot know that the Chinese are behind whatever. So we are also in a situation where we have all those weapons out there and we have politics which yeah, are sometimes in some kind of cowboy mood, <laughs> to use that kind of phrase. And, uh, what, and this together with an international law which might not really be suitable. So, so, so how to solve it? For me, born in 1980, it reminds me a little bit of the end of Cold War, uh, where all the weapons were installed and uh, the parties were arguing, but there were two parties. Now we have much, much more parties, and I think we need some treaties to yeah, reduce the amount of malware installed out there or something. Yeah, that's it. Well, talking about uh, international legislation, uh, uh, there are several initiatives uh, at the um, international level. For example, the, uh, well, uh, there is uh, the idea for, of a tribunal, for example, for cyber crimes. Uh, there are uh, several initiatives also, for example, within the UN for having a kind of like um, internationally agree the treaty on uh, cybercrime. Um, um, in my personal opinion, I do not think that this type of, let's say, um, uh, hard law uh, solutions, meaning uh, treaty and conventions, uh, can match with the, the way and uh, how fast, let's say, uh, technology and nowadays wor world work. Uh, therefore, I'm much more into uh, regulations and policy, what they are called soft law instruments. And with soft law instruments, you can have uh, um, uh, first of all, it's easier to get public-private partnerships uh, and it's easier to get the civil society actively working for drafting. I mean, uh, for example, writing a convention uh, takes uh, so many years uh, that I think it's important to discuss this at the international level, but if we want to react now, we need to take uh, all the suggestions uh, of the panel and make them concrete in more suitable legal instruments. 
Um, first of all, I don't like uh, the term digital weapon or digital arms because it's really, really stupid. Um, <clears throat> Um, and what we are talking about is actually uh, a word which, which exists uh, since a long, long time and called sabotage. And that's what it is all about. Um, for, for, um, for the person or the institution which get attacked uh, by someone, um, it doesn't make a, a difference if it comes from an army, from a, from a, or from a criminal, from an intelligence. Um, and therefore, from the, from the intelligence, um, intelligence community. So uh, it is simply like a criminal act, and that's the way our legislation has to 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 um, yeah, to work with it. It's not about you know like international laws on uh, how to reduce cyber weapons. That's stupid. Yeah? It's all about um, having. Uh, means for security and for de uh, defending um, infrastructure uh, and, uh, and so, so like communication um, uh, uh, technology from the, from the citizens. <clears throat> it's not about, you know, like uh, we have you know, weapons. It's not about weapons. Because the main, the main problem we have at this whole field is um, I can have um, some very, very simple vulnerability to take uh, uh, out hemocritical uh, systems. So it, it's not about weapons, it's about knowledge. I mean, as much as it would be really amusing to, to pass a law that says, well, if you don't, you know, include the, the little, like, I don't know, we can come up with an international standard to number all of the intelligence agencies and, and different, uh, different armies. You know, if you don't include this, this bit of bite, you know, this string of bites in your, in your exploit, it's a war crime. Um, you know, that would, be, that would be very amusing, but it's obviously never going to happen. Um, you know, and that's, and that's basically the fundamental problem is that this isn't, um, this doesn't fall under the, under, functionally, it doesn't fall under, under um, the laws of war. It falls under intelligence, you know, and intelligence has only ever been the law of the strong. Um, I mean, at least when I look at this in the context of leaders in particular, I feel like states have positive and neg negative obligations. This is clear. I mean, I, I got the opportunity to visit uh, the court in Strasbourg recently, and I was very humbled by its utopian idealism. And I feel like the positive and negative obligations that states have are something which are not even being de dealt with in a state-by-state -state basis, really. They're not, like in the U.S., for example, when James Clapper went and lied about spying on Americans, obviously also spying on you, this, there's no question about either of those things, um, he has total impunity. If I even set foot in the United States again, I sort of, well, I don't really wonder. I won't be setting foot in the United States anytime soon. So the fact that there is national impunity when it is a nationally broken law, it suggests to me that an international treaty will not solve this problem at all. We mean, we have international binding treaties in the United States, and you do in Europe as well, um, which are also not being followed right now. So another one might not solve the problem. I think ending the impunity is a really good thing. And I think there are economic sanctions that might be useful. There are uh, political statements that could be made that might also change the way that some people behave, though I doubt it very much. Fundamentally, I think the thing that will really change it is if the rule of law is actually applied equally and we look at these things and we say, hey, this is actually nationally not allowed and hey, you actually have an obligation to do something about this despite the fact that it's politically infeasible. Like for example, why is it that Edward Snowden can't get asylum in the European Union? And the answer is because most of the member states of the European Union are not sovereign when it comes to issues of sensitivity that the United States does not like. That is why. And so what good is an international treaty in that regard? It is not useful at all. It takes people with a spine at a national level and an international level to do something about that. So maybe that's you. But uh, it's certainly no one in my country at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. We have uh, 15 minutes to go and we have about eight or 10 questions. For, so please, uh, if you ask your questions, uh, be a, bit, a, a little bit shorter and maybe the answers also. Uh, <laughs> First question is from, from the front row, from number 13. Yeah, you talked about targeted uh, uh, law enforcement attacks when, they, uh, when people start encrypting everything. Uh, in my opinion, in my feeling, it, it wouldn't be that bad 
uh, because right now we have law enforcement with search warrants. If there is just some court oversight, even though it's not completely trustworthy, the courts right now, it's much better than an invisible agency that has no oversight. I, I mean, I know why you feel that way. It's uh, negotiating with terrorists, that's why. And I think that we should refuse to be terrorized by the state. So I think it's important to recognize that there's a fundamental tension, which is the one where they're going to hoard vulnerability information so that they can exploit your computer. And when they do that, that means they will not be able to keep you safe from all of the other people that also have IDA Pro and the ability to reverse engineer software. So it sounds like a fantastic trade-off in a sense because you'll have oversight, except that you don't exist at the top of that food chain, right? The NSA is way better than whatever country you come from in cyber war, if you want to call it that. And every time you choose that, you lose. So don't choose that. You're always losing. And they want you to believe that that's the choice that everyone makes, and it's not. There are plenty of people that don't make that choice, and you shouldn't be one of them either, because you will always lose in the face of their intelligence budgets. They have probably, in some cases, their intelligence budget is larger than the GDP of entire countries. So it really doesn't make sense to do that. Though, in theory, that would be great. The internet makes sure that your due process is not actually guaranteed by your state or your people being in that state, especially if they happen to travel out of that state. Then it's all, all bets are really off. We'll probably end up where targeted surveillance is something that is going to continue to happen, though. And, and that's happening now. And as Ella pointed out, we get both mass and targeted surveillance right now. But there's no reason that we should sabotage and weaken ourselves you know, to negotiate with these people. We shouldn't, we shouldn't accept that. I would like to extend uh, um, one thing uh, now briefly. Um, uh, one policy we are really discussing at the moment is um, the um, um, separation of um, offensive and defense capabilities of the intelligence agencies. Because um, for one, it was like um, a recommendation from the, from the NSA review panel from Obama, uh, but he, he didn't pick it up, but we pick it up um, because it is a good idea to, to have this policy, which means um, we need to have um, strictly non-military non um, uh, defense agencies which have no relation to uh, the offensive parts of the government. In the moment, we don't have that in most countries. Uh, we have, uh, in some countries, for, for example, in Germany, we have something similar, but it's not that, um, that powerful we would like to have. But um, I think this is one of the the policies we could, where we could win in the next years and where we could uh, have a good policy and a, a, a good agency for helping people to protect them. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have a question from, from here, number 94. Hi, my name is Nadia Lehmann. I'm with the uh, Pirate Party Sweden. I have a question that uh, Jake started to brush on. What are the holy cows in this debate, in the mass surveillance debate? Where, you know, we talk about the incentive structures that are actually driving this development. Where are they? Where does this begin? You started with a criticism tied to capitalism. Is there anything else we're missing? Are we having the right discussion? I mean, I think that that is a, a panel in itself. But to be short, uh, I think every time you see the word Muslim as a fair target, which you see all the time in the United States, and you see suspected terrorist or terrorist, we should question this. I mean, my country killed somewhere between 100,000 and a million people in the Iraq war using their surveillance machines. And then Carl Bildt turns around and says that surveillance never hurt anybody. Right? Part of the debate we should be having is that these guys don't have a power dynamic that is in their favor. And I think we should change that debate. It's obviously a power dynamic that's in their favor. And it's also the case that the rhetoric of terrorism is a way to basically end discussions. And the notion that suspect is actually the same as accused is the same as convicted is something that we should be changing. And the notion that surveillance itself is a legitimate process in that targeting and in some cases killing of people is, I think, um, wrong. It's totally wrong. And no, not many people are willing to say that because traditionally surveillance at a different scale with a different kind of surveillance being done was a part of lawful processes that were respectable. But on an internet scale, especially with regard to sabotage and especially with regard to assassination politics, I don't think it is anymore. 
Um, so I think there's lots of things to be said there, but a lot of the stuff that we hear today is really just thinly veiled racism. And I think that we should confront people about that. And I think cap capitalism is also an interesting topic that we should talk about about it. And we're not talking about the market of information that is totally unregulated and the benefits that come from that and having access to that. And we should talk about that. Okay, thank you very much. Next question is from Pirate Party Belgium. Here in the the Netherlands, actually, but I'll try to keep it short. I noticed um, Fukami and Ms. Bosco talking about uh, software liability, uh, kind of similar to how liability works in the meat space. However, I do have to add, though, how would this work with free software? Wouldn't free software developers be liable as well, and would this not actually harm the free software movement? When it is proven that free software actually improves information security more than closed source software does. The basic idea um, behind software liabilities is not um, that, uh, that a developer is liable for every mistake he has. For example, um, uh, it's not about, for example, getting um, yeah, trouble for bugs, but getting trouble for not fixing bugs. So if you have open source, you have um, a different way of, um, uh, of distributing software anyways. So a couple of those rules wouldn't apply to, 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 to open source at all. Because the main idea uh, uh, behind it is um, we need to be able to change software all the time, like at any time. You know, like, because in the moment, we have lots and lots of infrastructure out there um, which was built with like liabilities or like warranties for two years, but it's in the field for 10. And for most of those stuff, we don't have um, the, the, the source codes or, um, and we are not able to fix it. Um, but this has to change. And the main idea behind it is to be able to change software. So, um, so, uh, so open source would be excluded from um, those types of liabilities you would have with closed source software because with closed source, you can't fix it. So you, ha you have to have someone uh, who is responsible for fixing it. And that's like the simple idea behind it. Uh, I was about to say, I mean, uh, continuing on what you are saying, uh, it's not so much about uh, uh, um, uh, giving fines to somebody, uh, which works, let's say, for closed software, but it's more uh, creating more responsibility uh, using uh, secure developing guidelines, for example, I mean, and be sure that certain standards are, are met. And uh, uh, um, I, I just wanted to add uh, one uh, comment to the, to the question before. Um, uh, I totally agree with Jake. It's also a matter that, again, we are discussing about NSA and Datagate. It's not only NSA and Datagate. It's not only the United States, first of all. Secondly, we're talking about surveillance, but there are uh, lots of uh, different technologies and different uh, methods in use. Um, Again, I start from uh, what, uh, sorry, I continue on what I started since the very beginning. Let's talk about the rights and then we see how they are, which are the threats to, their, to these rights. But we shouldn't start talking about the threats because otherwise we always focus there. We should try to <laughs> change the perspective. A short question. So um, when I was speaking on, uh, as I brought up liability as well, in the area where I'm interested in liability is actually specifically instead of looking at trade regulations around malware. So one of the other things that you can look at around liability is around intent, right? So if you um, sell software that is intended to surveil, then you should bring upon yourselves liability for who that software is used on. Um, and so we can, we can carve out a fairly narrow set of liabilities which don't affect the general software market necessarily, although there are interesting things around improving infrastructural security in general, but specifically around dealing with liability for producing software which is used in the course of human rights violations and which is intended to be used in the course of human rights violations. The, um, the export controls issue is an extremely dangerous tool. The only reason why we won cryptography in the US anyway was because we defined software as speech absolutely and because we do have some fairly strong and fairly absolutist protections on speech, that was a strong enough lever that despite all of the national security objections, we got to have strong encryption. We got to bring that out into the outside world. We crossed that bright line at our extreme peril. Um, liability and narrowly focused liability 
is a very useful way of stepping back from that. Um, one other brief comment on, again, on the previous question. Um, surveillance is a mandatory function of states. As long as you have a state which has the monopoly on violence as an external ac actor, it needs to be able to see the world or outside it. Um, and this is where surveillance comes in. Surveillance is the way that states understand the world around them. Um, we can have a talk about removing the state monopoly on violence and coming up with another basic functioning of, of how we structure the world. Um, and I'm totally happy to have that conversation, but um, that's a much, much, much larger conversation than how we deal with surveillance. And if we want to deal with surveillance, that's one of the reasons why we can look in infrastructural and economic aspects purely because otherwise we're bringing up a much bigger conversation about how we structure politics. I, I, I wanted to echo only really one part of this, which is what Ella just said, where she basically summed up the notion that a person who's victimized by surveillance should have a right of private action. Um, we see pretty regular, I think that's what you were saying, though you didn't use those exact words. And I think that's clear. I mean, I work with people, for example, I work with a gentleman in Angola, and he was targeted by some people, and what, where, where, where should he bring his grievance? It's not totally clear, but one thing that is clear is that people that support, build the software that attacked him, he should be able to take those people to a court in some place to be able to say, hey, you sold it to a military dictatorship, they torture people, they kill them, I was tortured potentially. What about that? And I think that that's really important. And I think talking about software uh, liability in other senses can be really dangerous, especially when it comes to export uh, regulations and restrictions. I'm a free speech absolutist. I think the solution to bad speech is more speech. Um, so you should be owning uh, people that uh, write exploit kits for owning dissidents. But that's a separate problem. Um, and I think a right of private action is really a critical thing for people that especially don't have technical skills to defend themselves. Um. I want to add one thing. Um, liability on motivation is actually not a good idea because um, if you look, for example, to um, laws where you have that. Um, in Germany, we had uh, the hacker tools laws or it's still, it's, it's, uh, it's still in effect. It's like about attacking tools. Um, and since you need to have the exact same tools for protection or like to, to prove uh, how and, and uh, um, uh, in what way you are vulnerable, um, those tools have to be like um, and are freely available without any uh, uh, restriction. So, um, so the motivation of someone could be to have a tool which is like uh, not completely offensive still, I use it for, or I might use it for, um, for uh, enough for understanding my, my um, own vulnerability. So it's very, hard to distinguish and having someone at the court saying, okay, um, I don't believe um, that, that you had that motivation or this motivation, it's always very bad. I mean, I, I, I became a very big fan of very clear regulations when it comes to, um, uh, to, 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 to X of whatever, but not um, about the motivation. That's only um, reasonable when it, when it comes to, to, to real crimes, for example, um, they are murderer, yeah? so they are, um, it makes a big difference um, what's the reason why you killed someone, yeah? but it's, it's completely different in like, the software industry in my point of view. So there's a, there's a giant difference between a weaponized exploit or like the FinFly distribution system and, and math. I agree, yeah. You know, and we can, we can criminalize selling FinFly to dictators without touching NMAP or Metasploit very easily. I, I mean, I think we can, I think we agree, but I think it's important to clarify. What I'm talking about is exactly that. When hacking team has a contract with a country and that country is an absolute monarchy like Morocco and we believe that such a contract exists and they target journalists, those journalists should be able to take the people from hacking team to court and to be able to say, if you did this, you have to disclose it. You're a company in Italy, you're a company in Europe. You have obligations in the European Court of Human Rights. I should be able to do that. That has nothing to do with FX you know, or the CCC you know, putting out hacking tools. That hacking team and FinFisher, for example, use things like that. That's, I think, one of the costs of having free software. It can be run for any purpose. The four freedoms allow people to be jerks. But the point is that when there's a signed contract with a dictatorship, someone should be able to take them and hold them to account. Okay, now uh, last question from Pi Party Belgium here. 
All right, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Thomas Gordon from the Party Party of Belgium. And, uh, well, one of the things that I have noticed in the last couple of months is uh, basically the math is good. Uh, and on the other hand, they're breaking everything else, right? Uh, they're breaking every machine that they, they can think of uh, in every manner that they can think of. Uh, it's, it's kind of only limited by, by uh, your imagination, it seems. So w what I'm wondering about is uh, what, hap what actually would happen if we move to 100% uh, in crypto in transit and storage, but we still have these devices, right? And we still have, uh, you know, uh, as you described, Eleanor, the, the mandate to uh, surveil. So uh, what I'm kind of worried about is like, would they press the button? Because they've industrialized their tailored access um, tools. They can do it. We know they, they actually actively do it to, to a certain extent. But it seems like they can just turn it on for everyone out here. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, what, is that a scenario that you see happening or not? It, it seems like a, a small nuclear thing almost. They already have done it. I mean, we've got um, allegations of millions of implants in the field. But that's it's still a, this small. has already happened. That's still small compared to all of us. This is a data management and scaling problem. It it literally just takes a while to stand up systems that can deal with that volume of data. It's happened. But do you think they will? That's my real question. No, I think they have. Okay. Well, no. I, I, so I, 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 I do want to clarify. Uh, if we move to 100% crypto, do you think they will uh, move? radically further in that direction the millions but then it comes it becomes billions that's what i'm saying i think they are already moving as fast and as hard in that in that direction as 300 billion dollars a year can can move them all right <laughs> I, I think i'm i'm in total agreement with eleanor about the assessment about this i mean one of the things we revealed in der spiegel last december was that they have load stations where when you order a laptop or a computer on the internet your package is diverted to an NSA field station or potentially another so-called intelligence community load station where they add hardware or software backdoors to your device. Um, that, I suppose, is only the case if they haven't pre-compromised the device to begin with, either with a software backdoor or with a CPU backdoor, for example. And I think that it's important to maintain facilities in which you could build those types of things without having a load station in between you and your devices, both hardware and software. And that's one of the things Eleanor, in fact, was speaking about earlier. And I think she's right in that if you look at the amount of money that's being spent there, think of everything you could do and come up with 10 solutions, right, for compromising things. And then there are three things you didn't think of, and they're probably doing all 13 of those things. And so the question of will they automatically start attacking everybody doing this full-scale deployment I think that we have to say that probably the people in this room, especially people that are system administrators, for example, probably already targeted, probably already owned. Um, will they continue to do it for everyone? Well, it depends whether or not basically they can get away with it. And I think that in a lot of cases, whether they can get away with it is whether or not they can inject into a stream of data and find an exploit or find a bug that they can exploit to put an implant in place unless they already have an implant in the device to begin with. And then there's the question of how they would exploit it anyway. For some of the stuff, we saw continuous wave generators. This is one of the things that I revealed in Der Spiegel. They actually take, I mean, it's like Philip K. Dick level stuff. If, none of, if you guys haven't seen this, you should definitely look at it. They actually beam radio energy through like a wall into your computer and thus obviously into you. And if they have a hardware implant, like a little reflector, the retro reflector actually modulates the signal and reflects back what's on your screen or what you're typing on your keyboard. That doesn't scale the same way, but that doesn't mean that they might not try to put those kinds of retro reflectors into as many pieces of equipment as they can to begin with, so that when they target you, they don't have to break into your house first, for example. And those kinds of things are really serious, and they are already doing them. Absolutely, we know that. So this world needs a more peaceful products and peaceful jobs. Is this correct? That is the result of this uh, debate, or uh, can I say, uh, that this is not the result of this state. Because we have too much progressive and aggressive um, problems around the world, so we as a party and political modern uh, person, we should uh, think about a system where more peaceful Paul, products and peaceful jobs will Paul, exist. I'm sorry that I have to interrupt you, but it's, it's five o'clock, so uh, I think it was a very, very uh, cool discussion. 
but uh, because the, the time is over, so in the, we, 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 we just one have short to statement to that. Please, maybe, one maybe short. everybody <laughs> one last statement. One last statement, and then we are done. Okay, I'm I, sorry. Uh, just to, to uh, um, uh, a little extension. Uh, we should all know that, that um, our technology is owned. Um, we should know that all our gateways are owned and stuff like that. And uh, that uh, we, we can't change it right now. There's no way of changing it right now because we miss important parts of our technology as uh, open source, be it baseband, be it, be it uh, FPGAs and stuff like that, so basic technology. Um, but uh, the good thing um, uh, with crisis is always that you have the possibility to change policies and it's all about changing technical policies towards um, using open and free technology and, um, uh, and, and changing the foundation of our technical world. And um, it takes like 10, 20, 30 years yeah? and we have a fucked generation um, but still um, in the moment, we have the, uh, the possibility to discuss that to change policy in the future. Um, and, it's, uh, uh, and it's basically about how, uh, how and if can we uh, um, get a possibility to, to um, have trustful hardware uh, and, and later on like um, all software running on it. So one of the most disturbing doctrinal statements that I've heard someone make in the past a uh, year or so is about the what the um, this is actually why the international relations community came up with the word cyber and cyber war and all of the rest of this is because information security already had another meaning to them um, in certain parts of the international relations community information security is taken as a sovereign state's right to control the cultural information which crosses its borders this is a hideous fucking just god awful abomination that came out of the the um the piece of westphalia and a lot of the other things which are which are very early in the and the westphalian state structure you know one of the things that we need to pressure and and to talk about as a basic structural element is that human communication across borders human communication as a single globe is an absolutely unimpeachable human right and that any attempt to control that at the mass level, any attempt to, you know, whether you're the, pres or the, the Prime Minister of Turkey trying to turn off Twitter, you know, this is simply not acceptable, you know. This is not a thing that states get to do anymore. And if we can actually make that doctrinal point clear as a cultural element, as a, as a cultural position, I think it clarifies a lot of the mass surveillance because this is, you know, the flip side to the intelligence world is censorship and all of that is driven around this notion that there is a right to control cultural information, which is simply a concept which needs to go away. Um. Uh, continuing on what uh, Eleanor is saying, uh, uh, well, just uh, a couple of uh, closing remarks. One is, uh, uh, yeah, we're creating a culture. A culture is not created just by technical solutions and um, uh, policy uh, means, but it's uh, mostly uh, created by the people. So uh, the other thing uh, that I want to end with, it's more a suggestion, let's say, uh, uh, which is engagement. So um, it's very good that we are all here, but it shouldn't be a kind of like a, a elitarian discussion, but you should go out and talk about what happened today here and the, the issues that we discussed. And so it, it shouldn't be just um, a type of discussion that it's happening in various communities, but it, it should go out in public and also at certain uh, uh, high policy levels. I think... Um as a closing remark, I would say thank you for having me here again. I feel like I have more representation in the European Parliament where I'm merely a resident than a citizen uh, than I do in my own country, which is tragic for me. Um, but maybe it's good for you. I don't know. Um, thanks for that. And um, I think it's important to connect the things that we're talking about today with a much broader idea or set of ideas and so I would say that this is not about cyber war or cyber peace it's just about war and peace it's about freedom and about liberty and in this sense I think we should not feel 
well, overwhelmed by the tasks that we have in front of us. I mean, it, we have some monumental things to do with our generation. One of them is to keep the free and open internet, and that's absolutely critical. It's our generation's sort of task, I would say, one of the tasks that we have, and this is one of the sets of people that works on those issues. But there are lots of other issues that matter, and this falls into the world of social justice. And so some of these methods of social justice, like transparency in the age of WikiLeaks, that's, that is a method. Transparency is a method in service of a goal, and the goal is justice. And the same is true with the rest of these issues of surveillance and with censorship. And so there's a long struggle ahead. And so we should work towards building some solutions to this. So if you can, write free software, make free hardware, help Carlos with his, with his uh, proposal for you broke the internet and we should fix it. These are useful things we can do and we should remember that it's in service of social justice and civic institutions. And that actually I think is part of what makes for a democracy to be able to participate in that and to do that. So thank you for having me and thank you for having all of us. Yes, so I would also uh, thank uh, for all the speakers that they came here. And I think it was a very, very um, interesting panel. Um, those questions which we didn't uh, answer here, maybe we, you can, you can um, speak to them now uh, when, when you leave the room.